let me use this opportunity to briefly introduce um, myself and our institution. So, um, our working group is at the University of Applied Science, Sciences in Germany, in particular, Institute for Biomedical Engineering. And um, as a research group, we have really broad scope, broad, broad spectrum of activities. Uh, just to name some from a problematic of premature birth uh, that was in the past, now what we're studying is um, mechanical properties of cardiomyocytes. Uh, we are studying uh, possibilities of purifying plants from viral infections. Uh, we are studying, our, well, constructing new devices for microbiological sampling, and also we use neural networks for live search in solar system. So you see a really broad spectrum. So that's why, uh, well, I, I, I probably will not <coughs> mention some astonishing or exciting things about what like many people before did, and also probably I will not give you a really fresh uh, and provocative look like others uh, did, <clears throat> but in our activities we meet water from time to time, uh, strange behavior of water, um, and, and you know as a biologist you cannot really study life without studying water at the same time. Um, and really I do believe that all people here you are really very brave people because uh, dealing with water, studying water or having it in focus of your activity is not for faint heart people. It's really something that needs um, uh, well a lot of power, I would say. Um, uh, just to let me give you one more example before I really begin. Um, well, if you perform a liquid chromatography or reverse phase chromatography, um, you have to mix or usually you use methanol water mixture as your liquid phase, as your mobile phase, and uh, what you find out is that uh, the way how you prepare this water of mobile phase uh, strongly affects your chromatography results. So what I mean is, uh, what do you add first, methanol or water? Water into methanol or methanol into water? So how quickly do you do, do it? Uh, how you steer it, like clockwise, counterclockwise, all this will affect your results. So you will see clearly the peaks look different. And this is what can really drive someone crazy. Uh, so that's why I mean, dealing with water is really um, a very uh, hard thing. Uh, initially, I uh, wanted to report uh, something about, in particular, spectroscopic studies, but after having heard some talks here, I've decided, to, I've changed my mind, and I've decided to make it also a little bit broader. Uh, and in fact, I have like four subtopics today. Uh, the first will be about plasma cluster ions. And I'm going to speak about human hemoglobin. Uh, Afterwards, I'd like to mention some things we saw in particular about easy water. And finally, just one or two slides about fluorescence, uh, measurement of fluorescence signals and scattering signals. <coughs> so, the first chapter is plasma cluster ions. <coughs> well, I think many of you know that the air we breathe in uh, does not consist actually of molecules, but rather it contains really huge particles. Uh, any measurement you can do with mass spectrometry will show that what we have in the air are huge particles actually. They are not dust particles, they are so-called cluster ions. So um, a big portion of part of water in the air is not just, they are not molecules, they are clusters. So water in this uh, sense is organized in the air as well. So the molecular weight reaches 200 or sometimes 1000 Dalton, which is a lot as you can imagine. So those bulky, huge particles in the air have different charges, so we can see negatively positively uh, charged particles, and especially um, negative charged uh, particles are especially important for us uh, because. Um, Breathing them in makes us feel uh, well, feel happy, feel healthy. Uh, so many places that people believe are really uh, uh, good for your health, 
they are unknown also as producers, as generators of these negatively charged cluster ions, like waterfalls, like lightnings, forests, and also seacoast, by the way. That's why many of us enjoy really to be on the seacoast, because this mechanical perturbation, mechanical motion of ocean waves, this energy, drives that negatively charged ions appear. Well, it has been known uh, <coughs> for a very long time, actually, and even at the beginning of the 20th century, probably you've heard about Chirasque-Chantelier, uh, special isomers that have been used in order to produce negatively charged ions, and uh, afterwards it has been a little bit forgotten, a little bit so, uh, unfortunately, until uh, a Japanese company, Sharp Corporation, they discovered they, they found it again, and they uh, introduced it in their devices. <laughs> so this is what it looks like, a pretty simple ion, ionizer. Uh, basically, it uses uh, high frequencies and a kind of coronal discharge. And this energy is used to split water molecules and produce negatively and positively charged particles uh, in, well, let's say, equal proportion. <laughs> um, what they've discovered, and actually what brought them to us, to Germany, to Jülich, was the fact that, uh, well, negatively charged ions themselves, they do show always consistently this health uh, supporting effect, but if they launched it in a mixed regime, let's say positive and negative charged uh, particles have been uh, produced, uh, and emitted, they've discovered uh, some interesting phenomena like bacteria were killed quite quickly, viruses are inactivated within several seconds, uh, molds are killed within hours, and also some odors, unpleasant odors, they disappear. And they didn't know what happens actually, and this is what brought them to us. Well, the first thing we did, uh, we measured if it's true, and indeed we measured uh, concentrations of positively and negatively charged ions produced. We measured their molecular weight and we've confirmed that, that indeed uh, we have a lot of bulky big ions. So, and the proposed model of the creation was we need that we split water molecule into two particles. Um, I would say it is a superoxide ion and also a uh, kind of proton, but as you know, a uh, proton cannot exist alone. So that's immediately they uh, get surrounded from, uh, with uh, water molecules uh, and uh, the hydration shell I show here is actually, it's much much bigger usually so you have particles with this size and also bigger and bigger and some of them are really big <coughs> and one important question one needs to address in this case if it's not ozone that kills bacteria because this would be the first idea and any engineer would say, well, probably it's ozone that's killing bacteria. So this is what we also checked and we proved that it's not ozone. There are specific chemical tests that allow us to do it. So if not ozone, what kills bacteria? Well, that was the question we tried to address. Um, as I told you before, those radicals, these superoxide radicals surrounded by water, they are rather healthy. They are healthy for human beings, for animals and I do believe they are somehow healthy for bacteria as well. So those positively charged ions, well, it was a bit more mysterious, so what do they do, how they do it, and nobody knew it. It was 2003, by the way. Uh, we also proved that the combination of ions is really efficient in killing bacteria, so one hour of exposure caused many bacteria to die, so there, these red dots, red dots you see here, they represent killed bacteria, and one hour later, everything was red. So it was really quite impressive. Um, so uh, the idea was, what's going on? And what we did, we uh, performed several tests in order to check what kind of um, free radical, actually what kills, what does kill bacteria, did kill bacteria. Uh, what we discovered, it was really a free radical stress, oxidative stress, but not caused by superoxid radicals, but surprisingly hydroxyl radical, which is much, much more active. So how, how does it appear? So in, our, in this uh, picture you don't see any superoxide radical. Well, and then we uh, uh, developed a model which uh, has been proved 
many times actually in, in several laboratories. Uh, so this is a bacteria, and if um, airborne particles, so containing positive and negative charges, and like encapsulated radicals and ions in that, if they sediment on the surface of bacteria, they have a chance to recombine, they have a chance to break with each other on the surface. So as a result of that, uh, this simple reaction, uh, Harris' radical appears, and being an extremely active particle, we believe that it takes protons from, from the cell, from its molecules, and uh, by doing so, it kills bacteria. Uh, it would be interesting also to maybe to discuss later what's going on here on the level of structured water. Maybe we can see it also from another angle, another point of view, and to see uh, what um, these charged particles do from the point of view of easy water. So, next chapter. Um, uh, by the way, let me explain also what my primary goal is. I really like to report you some phenomena we saw, uh, and I hope uh, I will find some resonance maybe in your heart, and maybe we can discuss uh, some interesting uh, things together. Maybe you find something that, uh, well, you believe is also interesting for you or exciting for you. <coughs> so, another chapter is about protein, dynamic protein behavior. And uh, the story began with uh, studies from Professor Gerhard Arden in Germany, published 1998, where, uh, by the way, he, he, he was, I think, two times that he visited this conference and reported his result. Probably some of you remember him. There's greetings from him, by the way. Uh, so he discovered that red blood cells uh, become extremely softer at uh, body temperature. So if our te body temperature goes, rises a little bit higher than the normal body temperature, suddenly uh, red blood cells become much, much softer. So he observed it really clearly in the microbiome pipette experiments. And the question was, what makes them so soft? So what we found out is that it's hemoglobin that makes them softer. And in particular, there is a very interesting phase transition uh, occurring in hemoglobin at body temperature, uh, and it manifests in many, many phenomena like we saw change in viscosity, abrupt change in hemoglobin viscosity at this temperature, we observed changes in colloidosmotic pressure, which suggests aggregation events, and also later I reported about um, unfolding events, we see also uh, they accelerate at uh, body temperature. So, that really greatly supported a point of view that not many molecular biologists still share, that we dare not see protein molecules just independent, independent from water. So they should be considered as really as a system consisting of protein and water, and we dare not really see them separately from each other. So what, what happens, what we believe happens in this case is that uh, at uh, room temperature, hemoglobin is surrounded by a pretty thick structure, or we probably could uh, call it coherent uh, water shell. Um, and that prevents probably molecules from aggregating with each other. And if uh, upon rise of temperature, uh, probably thing of this shell happens, I don't know why, but we believe it is the case, and then the molecules, they aggregate, and those groups we can see with many, many different methods. And on the level of the whole cell, uh, it's really clear to see that uh, when the temperature rises, number of particles decreases in the cell, that leads to a decrease of colloidosmotic pressure, and there's a free unbound water in the cell, and this water goes out from the cell until new equilibrium will be established. And this explains also nicely the mechanical behavior of the red blood cells. So uh, since hemoglobin aggregates, its viscosity drops, and also the whole cell will experience mechanical changes so it, uh, it's now softer and can pass through the microbiome. Uh, well, uh, this phenomenon has been observed with many techniques 
And um, it was actually my turn then to put the next question, what's the role of solvents and other solids in this behavior? Uh, you know, hemoglobin is not alone in our body. There are lots of important molecules participating in many signaling events, CO2 and all ATP, and it's, everything is in phosphate buffer, which contains sodium and potassium. Uh, one uh, PhD student of mine, she performed many experiments, and her primary goal was to study how the thermal stability of hemoglobin is affected with buffer composition. So if we have a pure sodium buffer, or what if we have a pure potassium buffer, uh, or what if we increase the ATP concentration in the buffer. And also, nitric oxide is a very interesting signaling molecule. Probably it should have also some effects on uh, thermal behavior of the hemoglobin. So as you all probably know, uh, sodium and potassium, potassium, they differ very much in their properties and in their behaving in water, and in particular in their binding properties concerning proteins. Um, we've chosen um, several methods in order to give us most clear information about it. Uh, one of them was uh, circular decreasing spectroscopy, which has been mentioned in this conference. Another one is dynamic light scattering, which is a nice technique, technique which allows you to measure the molecular size uh, in a very direct way. So we measure fluctuations, Brownian motion. Uh, based on that, we calculate autocorrelation function, and the autocorrelation function is used to calculate diffusion coefficient, which in turn can be calculated in at least apparent hydrodynamic radius. Well, uh, these, uh, the next picture show us the, some data we obtained uh, here. Uh, if you cannot read this, I can explain. In a pure sodium buffer, uh, we increased temperature gradually and we wanted to check when the thermal denaturation of hemoglobin occurs. Uh, well, usual point was like 55, like around 55, 60 degrees. Um, and it was true for both buffers, so sodium or potassium based buffer did not really change too much the aggregation or behavior of the hemoglobin. Uh, but what we saw consistently was always that nitric oxide seemingly destabilized the hemoglobin structure. Uh, and we do believe it, was, it had something to do with water shell. So a nitric oxide being a free radical apparently has capability of kind of loosening kind of attacking water shell of the molecules, making them it less stable. It has been uh, also confirmed by some additional studies with gels. If you incubate agarose gel in the presence of nitric oxide, it becomes more fluid. Um, there are lots of results. Let me just focus on several of them in order to uh, not spend too much time. Circular decreasing data showed some other interesting uh, things. First of all, the, if we have hemoglobin in sodium buffer, um, and if we add uh, nitric oxide donor again, it again destabilizes the whole molecules. It makes it more mobile and less folded. And the addition of ATP produced also a very interesting effect. I, I hope you can see it here. This is without ATP, this is with ATP. So, I would describe the ADP effect uh, as a rather unspecific one in this case as a partial unfolding of the protein. So, it kind of unfolds, uh, the protein opens it a little bit. And we also do believe that this is, corresponds to more natural, more walking state of hemoglobin. Uh, and not this dead picture you can see in your handbooks. Well, where you have like hemoglobin crystal and they believe this is the molecule that walks in the cell. It's absolutely not true. Um, if we go to more natural condition that will be a potassium based buffer, this is the environment we have mostly in, inside the cells, what we discover is that hemoglobin is initially more open. So a potassium itself makes it more, more unfolded from the very beginning. And that's why the effect of ATP is not so profound, it's also more not visible, because I, I would describe this, there is nothing to do more. ADP, so potassium did this work, it's 
did unfold the uh, hemoglobin structure and potassium actually cannot just bind but it cannot be seen uh, well at least not using circular like reason did. So uh, there are many more things about that but let me jump to the next topic in order to have uh, more time for questions and so on. Um, uh, so, uh, third topic will be about easy water, and when we heard uh, about easy water for the first time, and also uh, Jerry came to us in Germany and reported the results, we are really uh, fascinated, and I'm, since then I'm a big fan of uh, him, and I'm following his new ideas, and at the beginning they act a bit like crazy, but then after a while you say, no, it really makes sense, and really interesting, and uh, I think it's really very exciting, uh, just even to observe his activities, and, but at the beginning we just wanted to prove uh, what's going on and if we really can reproduce his experience with the easy water. And uh, in order to do that we decided not to use nafion. Nafion we used as well, but we decided to use some other polymers, in particular polyacrylic acid, polyacrylamide. And we used a little bit different setup. Instead of using a hole and a big piece of gel, we used gel capillaries, a very thin hair-like gel structures, uh, which we put under the microscope. So here is the cross-section of this capillar, uh, this tiny hair of gel. And uh, here are particles, uh, polystyrene particles, and we observed, we tried to observe the exclusion zone. And we see some, and it was really a nice feeling to be able to reproduce it. So in uh, distilled water, we could see it forming easily. In PBS, it was also visible, but not so much, not so good visible. Um, uh, one series of the experiments done by our master students, Meta Kushun, was to check the effect of pH on the formation and the stability of the easy water and in that particular case, he <coughs> observed um, formation of easy water in um, very acid solution, so pH close to 2. And in the case, if pH was extremely high, so around 12, uh, something interesting happened. So the gel kind of collapsed and actually looks really strange, uh, in my opinion. Um, I guess it has something to do with the properties of the gel itself. As you remember, we used two types of gels, anionic and cationic gels. And uh, I think some of you, if you wish, you can try to guess, you can try to think what kind of gel it was. Was it a gel presenting acidic groups or uh, alkalic groups? So yeah, I, I would leave it to you just to have a kind of memory exercise, or, well, exercise, you know. Uh, just to think about what kind of gel we used in this case. So, and now let me jump to the uh, last topic, source uh, inspector and Roman scattering. Uh, this is chronologically the thing we did really, the last thing we did several weeks ago. We got a new device, spectrofluorimeter, uh, measuring fluorescence over a broad range of frequencies is a really nice and really exciting activity and we play, played a lot of with it and one of the models we used was just for fun uh, agarose, low concentration of agarose in, in um, water um, if you observe water if you try to read uh, fluorescence information from water you will get some interesting effects almost always uh, these are not our data but you can see it's a classical profile you would always see uh, at mm, his excitation, his emission. Uh, well, uh, UV range, you would see something from electron, electron clouds related effects, but what you will always see is some annoying artifacts that are actually scattering artifacts. And depending on the angle of those artifacts, you can see that either it is a Rayleigh scattering or Raman scattering. The difference between them in, is that Rayleigh scattering is so-called elastic scattering. So the particles perform elastically, which corresponds more to a kind of solid state. And the Raman scattering is mm, related to the loss of energy. That's why the emission wavelength is always longer than the excitation wavelength. So uh, in water we see almost always, so usually we see these uh, 
Raman scattering, which means that water molecules are relatively mobile. Well, but what if we add low concentration of agarose? And uh, here we have this sample fluorescent spectra of agarose in uh, water. We also worked with low concentrations, but basically the picture is always the same. Uh, melted agarose, liquid agarose, and solid agarose. Same sample observed at different temperatures. Um, and we were re really much, uh, a lot of, well, got, got excited about differences we saw between these pictures. So, again, we see these very strong scattering signals, which most of people try to avoid, try to neglect, because in their opinion, they don't bring any useful information. But we, in this case, we really tried to see, maybe we can get some useful information from rubbish from, from these artifacts. And indeed, what I believe we see is that addition of agarose uh, has a very structuring, strong structuring effect on water. That means that the really band appeared and it got stronger. That means even in melted state, presence of agarose brings a lot of order into water structure and the, in particular, some vibration bands visible here, they uh, correspond to organized state, to really structural state of water. And as it solidifies this, uh, principally the picture does not change, but of course we get more really scattering more and more because it's now getting more solid and we can see very nicely this phase transition of agarose between solid and liquid state. But as you probably know, agarose uh, contains well a lot of water, and most of this water is in a kind of structured state. It's really structured state, um, and we can see it relatively easily. So, um, uh, the my aim is in this case just to show you these pictures, and probably you would give us some interesting ideas. What would, could we, you know, check with this method? It's really a new method, and I'm really eager to try many things using this technique. And I do believe we can, could try it maybe just to, in addition to the techniques you, many of you reported, in addition to subject to spectroscopic studies, uh, maybe in addition to some MRI, MRI studies and so on. <coughs> and um, since I have a little bit time more, I'd like to um, have some proposal, maybe I, I have some suggestion. Maybe um, we could use this opportunity that we all meet together um, to as many speakers mentioned before, to act strategically and um, to try to organize our knowledge better. And yesterday Professor Koratkov mentioned a very important question about how we measure structuring of water, the level of structuring. I think it's a very important, very, uh, very good question and I would suggest that we believe with another one, uh, which is establishing a kind of reference. So, kind of gold standard of water uh, that would uh, help us to compare our results and that would give us some zero point um, to, to you know, compare our different studies. Uh, what I personally believe is that Medicure water that many of you used is not a good thing, not a good source of like standard, uh, because I, I dealt a lot with Medicure water and I do believe it's not really standard. There are lots of different sorts of Medicure water uh, as you know, it passes through columns, ion exchange columns, so it gets structured somehow. Uh, it's filtered, it's agitated, so in my opinion, it's not a good standard at all. Moreover, I have measured many times very high concentration of pyrogenic substances and endotoxins in millicure water. When I contacted the company and said, uh, what's so high concentration of endotoxins in my millicure water, they say, well, uh, you could buy one more column and it would make, uh, it would produce really pyrogenic free water. Uh, but if you don't know it, if you don't measure it, you have nanomolar, femtomolar concentration of pyrogenic substances and they produce huge biologic effect. If you don't know it, you never, you know, you never they will affect your results, but you never know about it. And moreover, if you want to make it more free, they treat water with UV light, which is again, uh, it's a manipulated water. So I just wanted to put this question uh, to open it. Uh, it. Maybe we can discuss later or now, uh, just 
which water shall we use? I personally do believe that distilled water really, distilled water, really distilled water is much better from this point of view. Okay, so um, that's it, by the way. Wow. I'd like to uh, thank my colleagues, Professor Gerhard Hartmann and my students who helped me a lot, who support me, and I also would like to thank you for your attention. Thanks.